Wow, thanks everybody for introducing yourselves in the chat. We have people from all over the place. That's great. Well, it looks like it's six o'clock, so I'll get us started. Welcome everybody. My name is Jane Rumrill. I'm the Events and Outreach Manager at Greenbelt. Uh, Essex County Greenbelt is a land trust that protects natural land and working farms across Essex County. We help conserve healthy ecosystems, clean water, local food supplies, scenic landscapes, and free accessible places for all to benefit from nature. Uh, I know I see some of your names that I recognize here and I, I see a bunch of members. So thank you so much for your membership. Um, if you're not a Greenbelt member yet, we really encourage you to join us. Uh, we're a member supported nonprofit. So that is um, what keeps us going. So uh, before we move along, even though we're online tonight, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. The properties that Greenbelt conserves are on the ancestral lands of the Penacook and the Pawtucket, groups of Abenaki-speaking people. For thousands of years, these inhabitants and their families fished, hunted, farmed, conducted ceremonies, and developed deep stewardship connections to these unceded lands and waterways. I invite you all to join us in honoring the elders who have lived here before, the indigenous descendants today, and the generations to come. Real quick, if you look at your screen at the bottom, you should have a button that allows you to toggle closed captioning on and off. Uh, there's also the chat button, which a lot of you have used. And then please take a look at the Q&A button. If you have any questions during the presentation, we encourage you to put those in the Q&A. It's a lot easier for us to keep track of what ones we've answered uh, if they're in there. And um, Dr. Dorian will answer as many of those as he can at the end. Uh, so with that, if you have any questions, put those in the Q&A, like um, how to use Zoom or, or tech questions, uh, I'll respond to those. But um, otherwise, I will pass it over to my colleagues at West Newbury Wild and Native. Thank you, Jane. And a special thanks to Essex County Greenbelt for hosting this important program with West Newbury Wild and Native. And welcome, everyone. It was fun just to see people from across the state uh, that have joined us tonight, as well as New Hampshire, and I'm sure we'll see some others from further away. No snow tonight. West Newberry Wild and Native is a group of residents from West Newberry and adjacent towns passionate about promoting native plants, pollinators, and wildlife friendly gardening and controlling invasive plants. We believe preservation of our community's wild and native lands is best done one yard at a time, one landscape at a time. And every gardener and landowner should be empowered to rebuild and restore healthy ecosystems. Thus, we're very pleased to welcome back Dr. Nick Dorian. Last month, Nick really uh, illuminated us about the secret life of wild bees in his fascinating webinar. If you missed it, a recording is on our West Newberry Wild and Native website, and I highly recommend you take time to view it. Nick earned his PhD at Tufts University, where he co-founded the Tufts Pollinator Initiative, which has a wealth of information on pollinators and native plants. Even more, there's lots of projects that they have done, and you can see the projects on the website that really help get the information into local communities. Currently, Nick is a postdoctoral researcher at the Chicago Botanic Garden, where he studies how to integrate and optimize pollinator gardens for biodiversity conservation. Nick has so much to share with us. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much, um, Carol and Jane, for and having me back. Um, I gotta say, this is the first time I've been invited back and the first time I've been invited back to a, for a program with, within uh, you know a month of giving a previous one. So I really appreciate your enthusiasm for all this information. And I think this talk is perfectly um, timed because the growing season is just about to begin. It made me smile when I saw you know, someone post that cellophane bees were out in Massachusetts. Cellophane bees, bumblebees, and and um, so butterflies are are about to emerge. Um, and the growing season is is such a, an amazing time to become astonished with all the wonder that uh, of life that lives in our gardens. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, fundamentals of pollinator gardening, um, something that I have. Um, 
uh, worked on on building over the last uh, five years or so as uh, I've tried to integrate my expertise as a, a pollinator biologist um, with some of my my own personal experience as a gardener and how we can design landscapes that explicitly consider some of those uh, that biology when we're, we're growing gardens. So as a as a kid, I grew up in uh, suburban Connecticut and I loved um, uh, gardening with my mom. Uh, one of the things that I loved about it was how it was a creative outlet, right? You you would put in uh, ornamental uh, impatience uh, and you got to play with colors, you know, some pink ones, some lavender ones, some white ones. Um, I remember vividly how the the water would beat up on a, a non-native hosta in the shade or, or how the daylilies uh, would scream orange during the hottest days of summer. And through this, I learned some fundamentals of ornamental gardening, which is that gardens are highly manicured, places that are um, lots of lawn, plants are evenly spaced and with lots of mulch. I also learned that a fundamental of ornamental gardening is that insects have no place in the garden. And I remember this because uh, of one experience um, drenching a, a rhododendron with pesticides. This is not uncommon. And unfortunately, this is uh, an aesthetic and a practice that is all too pervasive in how uh, ornamental gardens are stewarded. The issue is not that these gardens are not beautiful. Uh, many of our ornamental gardens are beautiful. The issue is that they're beautiful uh, and of interest only to people. And in um, in the 21st century, um, I think there's a, there's been a recent call and a, a recent movement to think rethink how gardens, uh, the place of gardens uh, on the landscape. Gardens not only are a place of, of, of beauty, but also can be a place of sustainable uh, landscaping practices and biodiversity conservation. And we have to ask this of gardens um, because of two key uh, uh, crises that, that face people today. The first is, I think, uh, the biodiversity crisis, which has been touted by many others that have been driving the ecological horticulture movement. Um, we're in the midst of the sixth uh, mass extinction of, of biodiversity on, on planet Earth. And unlike the previous five, uh, the thing about this uh, mass extinction is that it's uh, happening at an unprecedented pace, and it's driven entirely by human uh, anthropogenic modifications to the landscape. Uh, of the organisms most severely impacted, insects have received a lot of press in recent years. Scientists have sounded the alarms of insect declines in the Anthropocene, dust by a thousand cuts declines in insect abundance and diversity, and they implicate human landscape changes such as agricultural intensification and climate change. One of the thing, reasons why this is concerning is because insects provide a lot of services to people. They not only help cycle nutrients through the landscape and not only provide uh, links between higher uh, levels on food chains, but they also provide basic pollination services, plant reproduction, Nearly 90% of wild plants require animal pollination, and 75% of top global crops, such as blueberries and pumpkins, even our morning cup of coffee. I also add that it's not just economic services that insects provide. They also provide a, a wonderful sense of wonder and delight and magic in the natural world. Um, but um, since we're talking specifically about pollinators, one... Um, one story or, or one, one pollinator that is particularly uh, salient to illustrate this uh, idea of pollinator decline is the um, the rusty patch bumblebee. About um, uh, in the late 1990s, um, the rusty patch bumblebee was one of the most common uh, uh, bumblebees on the landscape in New England, and it was responsible for key pollination services of cranberries. And if you enjoyed cranberries on your Thanksgiving table in the late 1990s, the rusty patch bumblebee was responsible for that meal. By the mid 2000s, the rusty patch bumblebee had all but vanished from the New England landscape and was not found east of Illinois. I'm lucky now to be in Chicago where the rusty patch bumblebee still is eking out a living and I'm hoping to see it for the first time this summer. But the decline of rusty patch bumblebee over more than 90% of its range was sobering and concerning, not the least because we didn't understand totally what was driving its decline. There are things like pesticides, habitat loss, climate change, I consider those the big three, but also things like pollution, industrial agriculture, the pervasiveness of, of lawns and invasive species, leading scientists uh, to think that insect declines are not driven by a single threat, but rather by a synergy or a cocktail of threats. It is the links between pesticides and habitat loss and hotter and drier years 
that uh, together sort of spell disaster for our insect populations. And so where, where can conservation take place? How do we begin to address some of these declines? Well, one of the mo most uh, richest opportunities uh, is actually in our own backyards. Nearly 40 million acres of irrigated turf grass exists in the United States, and much of it is wrapped up in our backyards and our, and our front yards. Now, turf grass is not native to North America. It is not supposed to be here, and we make a choice to put this turf grass on our yards. And so we can also make a choice to not have turf grass on our yards and instead replace it with a less, something that's a little bit less ecologically sterile. And so this is where gardens come in. What if gardens could be a place where uh, we could uh, sustain pollinator biodiversity and other diversity of insects right in our own backyard? The second crisis that gardens can help solve I, uh, is, is the extinction of experience. This is what I consider to be the other really urgent extinction uh, happening right now on planet Earth. And this is a term from the social science literature that's been becoming a bit more popular, coined in the early 1990s. And it's the idea that humans are becoming alienated from the natural world. Um, in 2007, there was the Oxford Junior Dictionary came out with a revised copy. And writer um, Robert McFarland noted that some words like computer and data had been added into the dictionary, reflecting our ever-increasing technologically-minded culture. But a dictionary for children can only be so big, and so some words had to go. The words that went were all having to do with nature. Acorn, willow, bramble, wren, kingfisher, heron. These are things that don't really have synonyms and evoke a very particular sense of place. And yet, we're not necessarily, didn't need to be in a dictionary because children weren't using them because of our disconnectedness with nature. And so I think gardens are also intimately poised to help us connect back to the natural world. Who here hasn't been charmed by a bird feeder attracting birds to their backyard? Well, the same thing can be thought of a garden. A garden is a bee feeder. A garden is a butterfly feeder bringing nature into, you get a front row seat into the nature in your backyard. And in doing so, you can become more in touch uh, with the natural world um, with its myriad benefits. And so today I'd like to sort of ask the question, can gardens be beautiful, support biodiversity and help connect us with nature all at the same time? From my experience, gardening uh, for pollinators in Boston, Massachusetts at the Tufts University campus, I think the answer is overwhelmingly yes. In 2011, um, there was a parking lot at the end of Boston Avenue, right where Boston Avenue meets Harvard Street in Medford, Massachusetts. They, this was an old abandoned factory that had since been converted to artist's lofts. Tufts purchased the building and in 2015 renovated the, the parking lot into a courtyard, but the courtyard soon went into disarray and no one was looking after it. As a graduate student, I was excited at the opportunity that maybe we could convert this courtyard into a pollinator paradise. By 2023, 2022, we had converted the, uh, the parking lot into this, what we call the pollinator plaza. There was only, uh, the whole courtyard is maybe a 10th of an acre and with maybe only a uh, thousand square feet of garden space, we recorded nearly 150 species of pollinators in just three years of planting and noticing. And these gardens did not just have biodiversity benefits, but they were incredible learning spaces. We hosted pollinator safaris that maybe some of you attended, where our aim was to connect people with the natural world around them and use these gardens as spaces of discovery and exploration. Now, you may not have a tenth of an acre courtyard or a very public facing space, but pollinator gardening doesn't have to be just look like that. Pollinator gardens can take many forms. Here's a particularly enthusiastic gardener that has layered in common milkweed with false oxeye and this oak tree that's sh shooting up through the, the growth and some verbena in the front. Or they can be a bit more uh, ordered and ornamental with some ornamental alliums. But also I see this gardener has thought about growing throughout the season and there's some New England asters in the back that are gonna bloom in the fall. Or they can be as simple as a, uh, a, a ornamental garden uh, with pollinator friendly plants outside of a school with purple coneflower and anisysip and mountain mint, or in front of a business where most of them are, most of the plants are non-natives, 
but they've added in native perennials. And this was one of the best gardens that, that we surveyed during our, uh, our sampling in the Boston area for, for insects. Or I even venture is to say that this could be a pollinator garden. Sunflowers are one of the best plants that you can grow for our insects in New England. There are several bees whose only diet uh, is sunflowers. And even a strip of, uh, of sunflowers along a really dusty sidewalk can make a difference. So what is a pollinator garden? A pollinator garden is any area that's been intentionally cultivated to provide food and shelter for insect pollinators free from pesticides. With that, there's a lot you can do. And one thing that I hope you take away from this talk is that I'm not, I don't wanna be prescriptive. Your pollinator garden should be an expression of you. It should first and foremost bring you delight. And I hope to give you some tools and some ideas and some techniques for how you can steward your, your landscape to better uh, the better the landscape for insect pollinators as well. I'm gonna break the talk down into three sections. The first is who are the pollinators? Who are the insects that we're trying to help here? What plants should I grow to help those insects? And then how should I ma maintain my garden throughout the year to, to, to make sure that it's, it's safe throughout the life cycles of those insects? I call these the big five. These are the charismatic microfauna that inhabit our garden. There are bees, hoverflies, butterflies and moths, wasps and beetles. Yes, hummingbirds are pollinators and bats are pollinators in the tropics, but in New England and the Northeast, these five groups of animals make up the, the bulk of poll pollination services. Now, when we think of bees, and if, uh, if you didn't attend my last talk, uh, when we think of bees, I think many of us think of the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. But these are not the bees that we're trying to attract to our pollinator gardens. Uh, European honeybees were brought over by colonists in the 1600s. Um, and although honeybees provide important pollination services in uh, commercial agriculture, and they do make tasty honey, um, honeybees are less of an environmental issue in the sense that they're stewarded by beekeepers. Um, and they can outcompete our native biodiversity and spread disease. Um, that harms rather than helps the environment. Instead, the bees that we're trying to help are our native bees, the more than 4,000 species in North America, nearly 500 species in New England that come in every size, shape, and color. There are green bees and blue bees and red bees. There are bumblebees in the center, and there are bees that look like bumblebees but aren't. There are bees that are orange with green eyes and gray with blue eyes and bees with antennae longer than their body. And there are bees like bumblebees that sing at the right frequency and, and help to pollinate those flowers. When we're trying to grow a garden for bumblebees, it's important to think about what the bumblebee needs throughout its life cycle. Bumblebees in particular are social bees. They have a colony and the colony has a, a season long activity period. Queens right now are going to be emerging and they're about the size, a little bit bigger than an acorn, the size of a date. And the queens are going to emerge from hibernation and zoom low along the ground. You often hear them before you see them. She's already been mated, and she's looking for pollen and nectar to refuel after the long winter. She finds uh, pollen and nectar in this spring-blooming redbud tree, packs pollen into her hind legs, and finds a cozy place to build her nest in a pre-existing cavity underground, maybe a rodent's burrow or beneath a stone wall. She starts her colony and then workers, which are about a third to half her size, continue the colony growth throughout the summer while she stays back in the nest to lay eggs. Worker bumblebees are incredibly generalized and they visit a wide array of flowers. And so they're one, they're one insect that I think is, is easy to, to fall in love with in the garden. And it's a sign that your garden is attracting a native pollinator. In the fall, when the colony is big enough, they switch from producing workers to producing males and new queens to carry the life cycle forward. The males and queens mate. The males, uh, the old colony dies and the queens hibernate under leaf litter, underground, in an old compost pile until the following spring. However, not all bees are social. Um, and uh, other bees uh, can't afford to visit lots of different flowers throughout the year. Others have very small, short activity periods, and as because of that, they have very specialized diets. There are bees who only feed on ironweed, the ironweed bee. There are bees who only feed on asters, and they only come out in the fall when asters are blooming, aster bees. There are bees who only visit sunflowers and are only active in late summer when sunflowers are blooming. And taking stock of these different relationships uh, not only teaches us that our native bees are highly co-evolved, 
with the native plants on our landscape. But that knowing what these relationships are helps us be very particular and target particular groups of insects when we're planting our gardens. One insect who's, um, I, I'm going to encourage you to, to, I'm going to challenge you to try to attract or, or, or inspire you to attract is the bicolored striped sweat bee, Agapostum inverescens. This, I think, is a phenomenal gateway into just uh, falling in love with pollinators. This is a bright green metallic bee who's active in, uh, starts being active in late May, early June. Their favorite flower is purple coneflower. And uh, although they're not specialized on purple coneflower, if you plant that flower, they will come. And so on the 4th of July, if you grow Echinacea purpurea in your garden, this is your homework. Go out in the early morning before 11 a.m. and just watch your purple coneflower for five minutes and see if you spot a bright green bee with a black and white abdomen on your purple coneflower. This is not only a way of learning to read the landscape and learning to decipher who's visiting your garden, but it's an also an indication that your garden is working. Your garden is attracting a native pollinator and it's doing as it intended. Or perhaps this is be the first year that you plant purple coneflower because you want to attract the, the bright green bee. Now, the flower is not everything this bee needs. It also needs a place to nest and it likes nesting in bare patches of soil. This photograph I took in a patchy lawn, a lawn that was imperfectly kept. So it wasn't thick with sod. It was grassy to the, to the naked eye, but as you looked closer, there were little patches of dirt. This particular patch of dirt was created by birds beneath a bird feeder. As the birds scratched in the soil, they exposed the, the dirt. And instead of reseeding it with sod, the bees seeded themselves in the soil and uh, were nesting there. So um, thinking about what bees need at, at both times of their life cycle can ensure that our, 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 our gardens uh, are supporting native, native pollinators. But it's not just bees we have to think about. There are also other pollinators, butterflies and moths. And maybe something about bees you're not so excited about, but butterflies, man, you really want to attract a butterfly. Now, in order to attract butterflies and moths, we have to think about their life cycles and they need slightly different dietary needs. Butterflies and moths also need nectar, but instead of getting their nutrition from pollen like bees, butterflies and moths get their nutrition as caterpillars from leaves. In this case, the monarch butterfly, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, has an intimate relationship as a caterpillar with the milkweed plant. The milkweed is known as a host plant, which is the plant that butterflies and moths lay their eggs on and oftentimes are the only plants that the caterpillars can consume during development. In this case, a garden for a monarch butterfly has to consider nectar plants for adults, but also milkweeds for caterpillars. Now, many people often don't get to see moths all that much because moths are, are tend to be nocturnal and many moths are, don't even feed as adults. But one moth in particular, I think you're going to want to see. This is the hummingbird clearwing. This is a day-flying sphinx moth. The larvae eat viburnum shrubs, and the adults are just, when they fly into view, you're like, whoa, what the heck is that? Is that a bee? No, nah, it's like it's big and fuzzy and red. Like, what the heck is that? And then is it a hummingbird? You're like, no, nah, it doesn't look like a bird. I've never seen a bird like that. You try to convince yourself it's a moth. These, these, they're like the size of a cork and they cruise around making this whirring noise. And oftentimes they'll hang out at a bush for quite an extended period of time, hovering and dipping their long tongue into uh, the nectar. And so thinking about how we might attract a hummingbird clear wing into our garden, we have to think about nectar resources in summer, but also making sure that we consider what the caterpillar needs. In this case, uh, the leaves of, of viburnum shrubs. Hoverflies are the next group. And hoverflies in general, just consider them imposters. There are some hoverflies that don't look like other animals, but hoverflies generally try to make a living by looking like something that can sting because they can't. You know, it's easier for a blue jay to remember that black and yellow stripey things sting, I'm gonna stay away from them. And so a hoverfly doesn't wanna be eaten by a blue jay and it also looks the same way. So we're gonna play a quick game to see how well you know the difference between hoverflies and non. I'll give you some help first. Flies have three key features that differentiate them from non-flies. The first is that their wings are often held out in a triangle, and they just have two wings, although it's sometimes hard to see. They have stubby club antennae, so their antennae are not long and droopy, 
but often very close to the face, almost non-existent. And they have big bulging eyes, uh, sometimes with patterns on them. So let's see how you do. There's two images, hoverfly or not. Okay, left is a honeybee, right is a drone fly. An incredibly effective mimic, the drone fly. And in fact, the drone fly it has a cosmopolitan distribution reflecting the cosmopolitan distribution of its model, the honeybee. Besides the long antennae on this honeybee, one thing that uh, clues me in is that this honeybee has a pellet of yellow pollen on her legs. Now, although hoverflies uh, will eat uh, pollen in addition to drinking nectar, uh, they never collect pollen on their hind legs. Okay, this is a little bit trickier. Hoverfly or not. Okay, left is a bee mimic hoverfly, mulata, and on the right, we have a bumblebee. Um, the droopy antennae of this bumblebee male and sort of the fuzzy yellow face um, sort of are a clear giveaway. Um, but again, this hoverfly is a really, really effective mimic if you were just glancing. And here's the kicker. Okay, on the left, we have the hoverfly. On the right, we have the yellow jacket wasp. So this hoverfly is actually not mimicking a bee, but rather a wasp. And in fact, it was even challenging because it was on the same flower, uh, the, the, the same exact plant. And so one thing that, that, that I use to, to, to differentiate this is that uh, their eyes are, are patterned. Uh, bees and wasps don't tend to have patterned eyes and the antennae are, are fairly stubby. Another thing that's not really written down all that much that I've noticed is that when flies and bees lift off from flowers, the flowers often respond differently. When a bee lifts off, the flower sort of just stays as a flower and the bee, this bee sort of lifts away from it. And I've noticed that when flies land and depart, the flower somewhat like recoils and shakes. And these are things that I look for when I'm in the field, just as a way of sort of navigating and reading the, the insects in front of me. Now, it may be that some bees make flowers recoil and some flies don't, but in general, it's something I've noticed and it's a way to, for me to quickly assess and distinguish what I'm looking at. And so this all comes from just going out and, and noticing uh, the insects in your garden and, and sort of falling in love with them. Uh, yellow jackets, I, I don't really, I haven't really fallen in love with yellow jackets quite yet, uh, especially since they're often a nuisance um, uh, at my at the picnics and, and uh, uh, picnic tables in, in the fall. Um, these yellow jackets um, are, uh, are a social species. And although they are pollinators, uh, they, they, they often uh, relate to humans in, in more or in more negative ways um, in the fall. Uh, they are important pest controls and they eat biting flies and things like that. And in general, I think they have a net positive effect uh, on the health of our, of our environment. Uh, but the wasps that I'm going to encourage you to, to, to interact with are not the, the social ones that scavenge our, our food scraps, but the solitary ones, the ones that are lean but not mean, and they are driving machines. These wasps were made for speed. Look at that sleek, skinny waist, not very hairy. Um, and this wasp um, is called Amophila, the sand-loving wasp. Now, bees get their protein from uh, pollen and, and caterpillars get their protein from leaves. Wasps, uh, the baby wasps get their protein from other insects, they're carnivores. In, in the case of the sand-loving wasps, they are carnivorous on other caterpillar grubs. So this mama sand wasp, she was flying around and smelled on a flower, a nice juicy grub. She found it, used her abdomen and stung the caterpillar. It didn't kill the caterpillar, but it immobilized it enough so that she could carry it back to the nest. Now, as she carries it back to the nest, her life is fraught. She is watching out, out of the corner of her eyes, for flies that threaten to thwart her plan. These are known as satellite flies, and the flies are trying to lay an egg on the caterpillar that she has worked so hard to grab. So as she's flying, she's trying to evade the satellite flies. And in your garden, you can see this happening where a, a wasp is flying and it's being shadowed by a fly. The wasp maybe takes some evasive maneuvers to dodge the fly, and maybe that's what allows her to get back to her nest in safety. In another case, a naturalist observed the wasp stashing the caterpillar off to the side to distract the fly and then going back later to return it to her nest. And still in another case, the wasp might not be successful. The fly lays an egg on the caterpillar and her nest is ruined. All that being is there's an incredibly incredible wealth of stories and drama and danger and excitement right in our backyards.
In order to attract some of these wasps, you can plant nectar-rich plants. Ma wasps absolutely love mountain mint, and you often don't have to plant much more than mountain mint or, or spotted horseman, uh, Monarda punctata, to bring wasps to the, to the, the, to the party. Um, and these wasps are, are, are scaredy cats. They're incredibly gentle um, and are, are certainly not interested in bothering you. Some of the wasps that I love watching, particularly because they're so conspicuous, are our digger wasps in the genus Spex. These wasps wouldn't hurt a fly. They only hurt katydids. They love going after katydids and crickets, which are um, uh, often dwelling in trees or on grasses. Just like the sand-loving wasps paralyze caterpillars, these guys paralyze katydids and bring them back to their nests underground. But these digger wasps, as you can see, both were photographed on mountain mint and both were, were approached quite closely without much of a concern. They come in two color flavors. The first is um, uh, the all black with blue iridescent wings. And the other is orange Lamborghini, uh, all orange with um, sort of tea colored wings. The last of our pollinator, uh, uh, our big five pollinators are the beetles. It's really easy to be beetle paparazzi. Beetles are slow and fun to watch on flowers. They, they can't sting, they don't bite, um, and they sort of just sort of lope around. Beetles are some of the uh, oldest pollinators, the oldest lineages of pollinators. And in New England, they're, they're, they're not necessarily the, the most critical pollinators, but they're some of the, the most fun to watch. So this is the red milkweed beetle. Um, as a larva, it eats the roots of milkweed plants and maybe others have, have had different experiences. I, I've never known it to, to sort of outright kill a patch of milkweed. And so I think of it sort of as a nice partner to monarch gardening. If you're gardening for monarchs, you're also gardening for the red milkweed beetle. And one of the coolest things they do is as the adults climb out of the soil in late May and early June, they go to get to work eating the milkweed leaves. Now, milkweed is called milkweed for a reason. It's that there's a toxic sap that runs through the vein of the, the leaf. And that is not tasty good food for a milkweed beetle. That sap is going to gunk up its mouth parts. And so what the milkweed beetle does is it takes its mouth parts and makes a series of incisions, indicated by these black arrows, along the bottom of the, the midrib. And this blocks the flow of sap and creates sap-free leaf at the tip. And then it's free to go to the tip of the leaf and munch away on nice, tasty leaves without fear of getting uh, sap in its, its mouth parts. And this is just an incredible relationship between the beetle and the milkweed plant. And it's all because maybe you planted milkweed to help uh, another insect, the monarch. And so again, the more you notice, the more you see, uh, and the more it's easy to be astonished uh, by the, the natural world in your backyard. So I encourage you all to go pollinator watching. This is, I feel like sometimes I, I, I say this too much, but I really think it, it makes all the difference. Uh, at the end of the day, planting gardens for pollinators um, is, um, it, it, it's, it's a shift, right? We're, we're acknowledging that insects are worthy of, of, of gardens and of, of our care. And um, knowing the impact we're having can only come from us going out and, and seeing, seeing that impact. And so I've written a guide, watchingbees.com, that'll help you identify uh, wild bees from, from phone photographs. Um, and it covers about 50 species in New England. I recommend these Papilio Pentax binoculars, which are just phenomenal for getting up close uh, and watching butterflies and, and, and hawk moths in your garden. And then these nature bound bug vacuums were so fun to use on pollinator safaris. They're sort of battery operated um, and uh, are, are just an opportunity to sort of slow down the pollinators and, and, and watch them up close. So, you know, maybe you were excited by some of the bees I talked about. Maybe you're excited by some of the butterflies I talked about. Maybe you really want to attract the, the golden digger wasps. All this is to say is that your garden uh, should include uh, a lot of nectar. So prioritizing nectar plants. And it might also include things like pollen for our specialist bees or leaves for our specialist butterflies or, or woody plants for our, our moths or, or grasses for butterflies that eat grass or bare soil and stems for wasps to nest in or, or bees to nest in. And what you end up including in your pollinator gardening, again, this is not a prescriptive list, but suggestions and inspiration. What you end up including in your garden is reflected in your goals. And I encourage you, whether you're a brand new uh, pollinator gardener or a seasoned native plant enthusiast, to think about what your goals are for the garden. Goals are so important and yet so often overlooked. 
goals not only uh, chart our, uh, our give us a goalposts for where we're headed with our garden, but they guide our planting and maintenance decisions. It's far easier to ask or answer, what should I plant if you know what your goal is? And it also gives us a way of measuring our impact. Something that I noticed a lot uh, and something that sort of bothered me uh, as I was working through the pollinator gardens at Tufts was that it wasn't quite sure what it meant for a pollinator garden to work. Maybe what it means to work is that we've attracted the bicolored striped sweat bee. Maybe what it means to work is that we support the larval monarch butterfly and that providing milkweed is really key. And so just specifying what we mean, I think, can be uh, really impactful and make a lot of the decisions a lot easier. Goals don't have to be static. We can update them every year. It's a different challenge for the growing season. So maybe one goal this year would be to attract the bicolored striped sweat bee, but you might want to change it to a different insect the following year. And the goals don't just have to be ecological. I encourage you to set personal goals, like a colorful garden with native plants or a place to relax or a place that I enjoy spending time as much as my children or, or grandchildren. And that doesn't interfere with recreation. So think about what your goals are. And I encourage you to think about how pollinator gardening might be compatible with those goals. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about the, the next two questions, what plants should I grow and how should I maintain my garden, which uh, are questions that I, I get quite frequently. I have, like there's the big five pollinators, I have five ideas to share with you. The first is that diversity begets diversity. The second is that we should prioritize native plants. The third is that trees and shrubs are superheroes. The third is that buyers should be beware. And then the last one is right plant, right spot. So tenant number one of pollinator gardening, diversity begets diversity. And what do I mean by this? I mean, in the idea behind attracting a large diversity of insects is to diversify the plants in our garden across several axes, color, shape, size, and season. When we plant flowers with different colors, we can attract different insects. For example, blues and yellows are highly attractive to bees. Reds are very attractive to hummingbirds and butterflies that have different color receptors than bees. Bees don't see red very well. And so if you go out in your garden, notice whether bees are ever uh, are more on red flowers or white flowers or blue flowers. Um, it's not random. I can guarantee you that. And still, beetles and flies often like very white and fragrant flowers, uh, like uh, elderberry or uh, shrubby dogwoods or spirea. That sort, sort, sort of smell may be pungent, may be sweet, um, but often uh, they need that extra uh, smell uh, reward to, to find the flowers. I encourage you also to plant flowers with different shapes and sizes. And by that, I mean pollinators can't all access flowers equally. Bumblebees have long tongues, and that allows them to access flowers like this bee balm that has a long corolla from the entrance of the flower to the depth, to, to the, the base. So bumblebees and butterflies can access flowers with deep corollas, but a fly, a fly is a very short tongue. A beetle is a very short tongue. Small bees, very short tongues. They'd be hard pressed to get nectar out of this bee balm. And so ensuring that our garden also has flowers with short uh, corollas like this, um, uh, uh, like the yarrow is important to uh, supporting a diversity of insects. I also encourage you to plant flowers of different sizes and shapes in clumps. When bees are traveling through the gardens, they like having big targets to land on. And these targets uh, can be uh, uh, clumps of flowers. So here's this blazing star in a big clump. Here's this rudbeckia in a big clump. Here's this sort of uh, allium, maybe nodding onion in a big clump, and this lobelia in a big clump, rather than randomly interspersing one plant at a time. Now, it can be hard to maintain these, the, the, the order of these plantings through time. Uh, and oftentimes plants will move throughout the garden, something that I think is a, a very fun and unexpected part of, of gardening for pollinators is how plants move through the garden. But in general, when you're planning out a garden, I encourage you to think about planting in clumps. Another thing that bees do is a behavior known as trap lining, where male bees um, will patrol up and down gardens and land on very particular flowers, sometimes particular leaves, uh, as they look for females. And female bees will patrol particular uh, pollen plants uh, because those were previously very rewarding. 
And so having large targets um, that with, with reliable pollen sources can be important uh, for bee biology and, and, and helping them the way they, they remember the landscape. And the last way to, to, to vary the diversity of the plants in your garden is to think about season long blooms. Now, bumblebees we talked about have a requirement for flowers from early spring all the way to fall. But many of our other bees and pollinators have activity periods that are much shorter, maybe only three to four weeks out of a given year. Ensuring that something is blooming every week or every other week ensures that if an insect is out, it has something to eat in your garden. So think about how in every month of the year, can you, can you vary the, the buffet that you're offering? In April and May, can you have both deep and shallow flowers? In June and July, can you have both deep and shallow flowers of different colors? And think about how you, what the progression of your garden is over the year. I don't think this idea is all that at odds with the traditional aesthetic idea of, of many ornamental gardens, which is you want you know, season-long interest. However, this time we've thought about how season-long interest matters from a bee's perspective. Um, and uh, I, if, if you're like me, something that I always look for in the garden is like, how long can that bloom season go? And one year we had something blooming from the third week of April all the way to the first week of November well outside of when we ever saw insects in our gardens. And that was really nice to me because I said, we are open the entire growing season for uh, pollinator visitors. Tenant number two is when we're picking plants for our garden, we should prioritize native plants. These are the plants that pollinators have co-evolved with, the ones that have been uh, living on this landscape for the last 10,000 years and is the reason why we have specialized relationships between pollen plants or, 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 or larval host plants. Um, our native insects have tight relationships with our native plants, and these provide the best nutrition uh, for them. I've summarized some of uh, my favorite plants to grow, not only because of the, their high pollinator value, so the number of species that they support, but also their role as host plants. So if you see one asterisk on, a, on an image, it means it serves as a host plant for either a butterfly or a bee. And if you see two, it serves as a host plant for both butterflies or bees. And also ease of locating it in the nursery trade. Some of the issues with long lists of plants is that they're not always easily sourced. And so what I've tried to do is demystify some of those decisions at the garden center for you and provide recommendations for plants with high value and that you can find uh, quickly. So we'll take you through goldenrods and wood asters in New England are some of the best plants for uh, pollinators. They have really high rates of specialization with bees and, and butterflies and moths. Um, and, and they also uh, provide the bulk of floral resources in, in natural communities starting at, at the end of August and going all the way through October. Joe pie weeds and bone sets. Milkweeds are really ch champion plants in the garden. Um, and as I was uh, compiling some of this information, I was surprised at how many different insects uh, depend on common milkweed and swamp milkweed at various parts of their life cycle. Mountain mint uh, gets a shout out for just being the plant that attracts the big five the most consistently. You can go to a single mountain mint plant and find bees, butterflies, wasps, beetles, and hoverflies uh, consistently uh, every day of bloom. Uh, purple coneflowers, Monarda, uh, Rudbeckia, Ironweed, and Liatris also deserve shout outs. Um, and I think that um, you plant us in the, please in the ground and, and you won't be disappointed with the, the diversity of insects that, that show up. Now, not everyone has a shade garden, a sunny garden. And so I've also provided alternative recommendations for these top 10 if you have a shade garden. Again, goldenrod and wood asters sort of take the, the cake. Um, and there are golden rods and, and wood asters that also thrive in shady locations. Golden alexanders deserve a special shout out. They have specialist butterflies like black swallowtail and specialist bees, the, the golden alexanders mining bee. There's the geranium mining bee and butterflies and moths that depend on wild geranium for pollen. Maple leaf viburnum, as I pointed out, the host for our gorgeous hummingbird sphinx moth. Um, goat's beard and black cohosh couldn't be more of a classic beetle plant growing in the understory. Many of our native beetles uh, develop in decaying wood or leaf litter and are found more commonly in near, near to forested areas. 
And so if you live near a forested area, a goal of your garden might be to support beetles and planting things like goat's beard and black cohosh, which are, are fragrant white flowers, um, would do a lot to providing resources for those beetle pollinators. I became familiar with purple flowering raspberry last year for the first time uh, at a garden center in uh, Central Mass, uh, Amy Pulley's uh, wing at a prayer nursery. And it was just, I was floored at the diversity of bees that were visiting this flower. Um, bumblebees do this thing called buzz pollination where they, they grip the anthers and they vibrate really fast. And it was just so fun closing your eyes and listening to the symphony of bees on this uh, flowering raspberry. And then Joe Pieweed and Sunflowers are two, two other additions to the shade garden that uh, pull, their, pull their weight in, in pollinator value. I don't want you to overlook grasses either. I overlook grasses for many years, but grasses have a uh, tremendous value in both uh, for pollinators as well as sort of the, the, the design and health of your garden. So uh, some grasses that are, 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 pro are provide food plants for skipper butterflies. So the larvae, instead of eating leaves of herbaceous plants, they eat the leaves of grasses. And so those all of, all of these here are, are host plants for native butterflies. Um, they're, they, are, they provide shelter and sleeping sites for adult insects. I, I find cabbage white butterflies perching on uh, leaves of, of grasses. I find longhorn bees biting the stems and sleeping together in little slumber parties at night. And something that I learned during the drought that we had a couple of years ago is that grasses provided a really important green mulch to the garden. And the plants that were growing beneath the bases of grasses or growing through the grasses survived a lot better I think in part because of the retained moisture in the soil and perhaps the cooler temperatures from the grasses overhanging leaves. So think of grasses not as something uh, or as detractors or because they don't provide nectar as something that should be avoided in the pollinator garden, but celebrate them as companions and, and collaborators uh, in this work. I didn't mention trees and shrubs in the last section because they deserve their own section. Trees and shrubs are superheroes in the pollinator garden. They provide an order of magnitude more flowers than our herbaceous perennials. They are often spring flowering in New England, which fills an important resource gap. You know, the earliest, some of those flowers I provided on the previous slides, they start blooming in the middle of May. Some pollinators like our cellophane bees have already completed their life cycles by that time. Many of our woody plants are key host plants for our, our moths and butterflies. And trees and shrubs also provide uh, nesting sites and nesting materials like sap and resin that our herbaceous perennials can't. Um, these are uh, the shrubs. So uh, multi-stemmed plants with high pollinator value, uh, cherries and plums, dogwoods, meadowsweet, roses, willows, all champion plants in the garden. Willows have specialist bees and moths. Um, uh, shrubby dogwoods consistently come out as supporting the, the big five, one of the plants that supports the big five the, the most. And then summer sweet, viburnums, uh, buttonbush, uh, chokeberries, and blueberries. Um, again, all any of any one of these would be a valuable addition to increasing the biodiversity of insects that your garden supports. Uh, native trees with high pollinator value. Uh, again, I, 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 I've offered I think close to 30 different genera of plants tonight uh, of ways that uh, a simple addition of one or two of these could, could greatly enhance the value for, for pollinators in general. Black cherries, maples, crab apples, hawthorns, uh, service berry, redbud, liriodendron, basswood, sumacs. This is a mating wasps on sumacs um, and, and oaks. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, Doug Tallamy's recommendation to, to, for, for oaks, to plant oaks. Uh, they support uh, a very high number of, of moths, uh, larvae in, in the area. Um, and oaks are, are excellent as host plants for, for, for butterflies and moths, but oak flowers don't provide any nectar. And so I think uh, you know, making sure that our landscape has flowering trees that do provide nectar and pollen is key to ensuring that our gardens do support more uh, different kinds of pollinators. So black cherries, the flowers provide pollen and nectar, and the leaves provide suitable host plants for, for larvae. And it's not just that, these trees provide berries and berries galore, southbound rose-breasted grosbeaks heading to Costa Rica, fueling up on the fat, uh, fatty uh, berries of black cherry. 
red-eyed vireos. I got I got into all of this through in part through bird watching. And so thinking about how I can bring in a red-eyed vireo to our urban garden by planting a shrubby dogwood that also feeds beetles and whose berries were produced by the pollinators I'm trying to support. Ah, oh, it's just uh, when you think about interactions this way, it's really encouraging. And then sumacs, great catbirds that are southbound to Mexico. The fledglings are fueling up on sumac berries as they're growing new feathers. And then the adults uh, southbound along the coast as they head um, uh, for their wintering habitats. Um, uh, just some recommendations for where to source native plants in New England. There's some, there, there's a, a growing contingent of native plant nurseries that seeking to, to increase the access of native plants in the area. Things like Foundwell Farm, Bagley Farm, perennials, blue stem natives. A shout out to Wing and a Prayer Nursery in Cummington for, for, for being that place that introduced me to uh, purple flowering raspberry. And, and Amy, Amy Pulley is a, a wonderful person to get to know. Um, there's a, an annual plant sale through Grow Native Mass. Um, the Native Plant Trust has Nasami Farm and Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Wild Seed Project in Maine doing excellent work. And then if you can get together a, a group or, or apply for a wholesale uh, to be able to purchase wholesale plants as a, as a collective, I recommend uh, getting plugs from wholesale nurseries. Plugs are small plants that typically have one to two years of growth on them, uh, and they're much cheaper. So uh, a gallon plant might run you $15 or $20. A quart might run you 10. One plug would be one to a dollar to a dollar 50. And so if you can uh, get together a group to, to make a purchase uh, of 50 to 100 plugs, uh, it can be quite economical to plant lots of pollinator gardens at once. And I, I, I have very positive experience with Pinelands Nursery. The plugs that went into our gardens at Tufts came from Pinelands Nursery, which sources native ecotypes to, to the Northeast. Tenant number four of pollinator gardening is buyer beware. This is basically that I want you to be aware of a few things when you're a consumer of native plants. First, be aware that nursery plants can be pre-treated with pesticides. I encourage you to avoid neonicotinoid treated plants. Neonicotinoids are a very lethal class of pesticides um, with known lethal and sublethal effects. By lethal, I mean they kill insects, and by sublethal, I mean they impair things like cognition and memory. I encourage you to seek out organic seeds or plugs and requesting at your nursery that the nursery can guarantee pesticide-free guarantee. Request pesticide-free guarantee, not pesticide guarantee. You don't want them to guarantee pesticides. Pesticide-free guarantee from your nursery. I encourage you to be skeptical of great for pollinators advertising. This sort of stuff is straight up greenwashing. You can't plant uh, a pollinator garden for uh, $6 of seeds. And in general, these seeds are uh, non-native, not actually good for pollinators. You'll notice that with the exception of uh, purple coneflower on here, none of them are uh, mentioned on uh, those, those pollinator powerhouse plants that I, I showed earlier. Um, and really actually don't do a good job of supporting the native pollinator biodiversity in our area. Not to mention many of them are exotic and invasive. I encourage you to be aware of cultivars. Now, wild type flowers are those that exist in the wild, the ones that our pollinators evolved with. Humans have meddled with some of these plants and developed cultivars to appeal to our tastes, not the tastes of pollinators. In some cases, the modifications that we've made are benign. In other cases, they're bad. And this is such as the case with the teddy bear sunflower. It's a fun, intriguing cultivar, but it provides nothing in the way of resources, pollen and nectar for bees. It's physically impossible for a bee to access the pollen and nectar because there's so many freaking petals. But also something that happens when we modify floral parts is that when we favor petal production, we actually downregulate nectar and pollen production. So it may be that there actually is no pollen and nectar for the bee to access. The plant is no longer reliant on a pollinator because it has humans to breed it in the lab. And so those floral, repart, floral parts can be di divested from. I encourage you to also think about the non-native plants in your garden. I'm not going to prescribe absolutely no non-native plants, but avoid these particular non-native plants in the sense that they don't provide any nectar or value to insects. Petunias, daylilies, ornamental roses, Native roses have five petals, and these ornamental roses have dozens. It's hard for to see where a bee would get food from there. 
and these mop head hydrangeas. I'm not going to try to prescribe no non-natives. There are some non-natives that are actually quite valuable and sort of are okay. Lavender is one of them. Dill and fennel, cosmos, zinnias are great. They're sort of like these sort of nice uh, statues um, in, in the landscape where they're not, they're not doing a ton. They are providing nectar and they're also not escaping and invading our, um, our woodlands. I like to think of daffodils this way. I love seeing daffodils in spring. Is it a native? No, it's not a native. Is it providing a lot of food for our bees? Not really, but it sort of cheers me up and it's not doing a ton of harm. And so if my garden can be a source of delight through daffodils, but also have other plants uh, like our, our native shrubs and our native uh, perennials um, throughout the growing season, I think that's a nice win-win. One of the things to know is if, if a non-native plant or a cultivar uh, benefits an insect is just notice, like go out and look. The insects will tell you if they like the flower or not. And a plant with no insect activity on it on a nice summer day, probably not providing all that much food in terms of ins for insects. And then tenant five is the right plant, right spot. Um, this is something that I learned the hard way. Not every native plant on every pollinator list you encounter will thrive in every situation. Plants evolved in particular soil and light conditions. There are plants that like a lot of shade and don't like a lot of sun or are not very good competitors. There are plants that are really good competitors in wet and sort of wither in dry conditions. So before you plant, I encourage you to evaluate the moisture and sun at your site and then to embrace constraint. There is a native plant in every situation. Don't worry if you have a really wet garden, there's a, a, a palette of plants that you can choose from. If you have a really dry site or a, a hell strip along a, a sidewalk, there's a native plant that can live in that situation. And it's how we put plants together that will ensure that that garden survives. This is something that I get quite asked a lot. And so I, I thought it would be fun to sort of take some of my ideas and some of the things I've been thinking about and just give you guys some inspiration. So I've come up with several garden designs. And again, these are things that I enjoy thinking about. I have some goals that I wanted to achieve and I, I present these uh, to inspire you. This one I call Pluvia. It's the moist and sunny garden. There are uh, plants in here that are easily sourced at the nursery to attract butterflies, bumblebees, and because I'm a bird watcher, ruby-throated hummingbirds. So I've thought about shrubs by including summer sweet. I've thought about grasses and sedges by including panicum switch, uh, switchgrass and fox sedge, which are sort of wet loving um, graminoids. And then I've also thought about a diversity of shape. Wild bergamot has deep tubular flowers. Swamp milkweed has sort of flat flowers and black-eyed Susan. Joe pieweed is one of my top 10 uh, perennial plants. And so I wanted to include it. And it also loves sort of growing along shady, uh, sort of wet riverbanks. And then cardinal flower is sort of the, the plant that hummingbirds evolved alongside in Eastern North America. And so it wouldn't be a hummingbird garden without cardinal flower. And importantly, all of these plants have similar growing conditions. And so they're, they're all going to sort of uh, like the site that I have. If you have a different kind of site, perhaps a hell strip along a sidewalk, dry and sunny, really bad soil, there are native plants that can thrive there. So the goal for this garden was to beautify your sidewalk. You can't water it after the first year because it's hard to get the hose out there and you wanted to attract a diversity of insects. So for this, I recommend things like yarrow, butterfly weed, spotted horseman and black-eyed Susan, all of which are drought tolerant, sun loving um, and, and, and sandy soil loving plants. And to increase the sort of viability of this planting, we make sure to add a lot of grasses, green mulch, that'll reduce the soil temperature and keep that moisture uh, in the soil when it does rain. If you have a shade garden, I come up with a garden I call Umbra. This is a garden that is designed to replace hard to grow lawn in the back of a, a yard where there's, there's a lot of shade. We wanted a long blooming season for something to look out from the kitchen window and we wanted to support some fall active specialist bees. To do that, uh, we planted wild geranium and maple leaf viburnum for the spring. We planted black cohosh for the summer, which is sort of interesting to look at as the big candles wave in the wind, and then asters and blue stem goldenrod in the fall to support our fall active specialist bees. One of our bees is a bright green metallic bee, and it actually lives in rotting logs. Many of our flies and beetles like decaying logs too, so we've added a little log pile off to the side. 
When a limb falls in a storm, we put it off to the side rather than carting it off somewhere else. And in doing so, we provide a home for insects in our garden. The last is something that I get a lot, which is a container garden. I consider this garden the, the nano garden. And the idea behind this is that there are plants that thrive in a container or restricted growing uh, area. New England aster, anise hyssop, purple coneflower, and partridge pea are four plants that could beautify a balcony to relax after work, help you learn about pollinator gardening in sort of a, a cheaper, a lower investment way, and then attract butterflies and bumblebees uh, to your balcony. And the last section of the talk, I realize it's already six o'clock, but if you can stay on, I have some tips for how you can maintain your garden to benefit um, uh, uh, pollinators. The first is to leave the leaves, stems, and logs. The second is that less is more. The third is to mulch purposefully. The fourth is to eliminate pesticide use. And the last is to experiment. There's a growing movement in uh, North America right now to leave the leaves, that leaves are not litter and instead leaving the biomass of our yards where it falls is really important for soil health, environmental sustainability, and the lives of some of our insects. Um, I encourage you in the, when instead of carting your leaves off or blowing them with mechanical leaf blowers to rake the leaves into a two inch layer over a garden bed. Not only uh, does this allow you to sort of uh, leave the leaves where they are, but it leaves the yard a little bit tidier. And it provides home for insects like morning cloaks, eastern commas, black swallowtails, and brown belted bumblebees, all of whom depend on leaf litter and cover to make it through the winter. Other insects like the red banded hair streak and the slowpoke moth eat decaying leaves. They literally eat leaves that have already fallen as their main host plant. The red banded hair streak eat decaying sumac leaves, the slowpoke eats decaying oak leaves. And so by leaving oak leaves on your garden bed over a couple of seasons, you can provide habitat for the slowpoke. So a great name. I really encourage you not to shred leaves. If you shred leaves, it's a really tempting to sort of provide green mulch for your, your garden, but it, it also shreds the pollinators. So this is something to, to definitely avoid. Leaving those bunch grasses standing in your garden can provide shelter uh, for insects the year after during the growing season. Those brown stems can fall over and provide homes for surface nesting bumblebees, like the brown belted bumblebee. And also those leaves that fall over protect the, the base of the plant and young seedlings against hard frosts in spring and provide a nursery for new plants to come up uh, in your garden. Some native bees can also nest in dead standing stems. And the key to this is to leave your stem standing for two years. So in the first year, your plant is growing and it produces green stems. You cut those stems back to about 12 inches and then you leave them. The next growing season, these dead hollow stems are homes for bees. The bees go into them and build their nests and stuff them with pollen and nectar. Can't cut those stems quite yet, the next year after the next winter, bees will then emerge from those cut stems. They need a winter to complete their life cycle. And so good hollow stems for bees could be milkweeds, wild bergamot, monarda, joe pieweed, things that have sturdy hollow stems that, uh, that are common, commonly grown in gardens. I don't recommend that you purchase bee hotels at big box stores to leave stems. Uh, these are often not made with insect biology in mind. And if you want to ask a question, I, I would be happy to answer why you shouldn't do this. But in short, it can lead to a buildup of pathogens and can also foster the proliferation of exotic species over native species. And I already made a case for leaving a log pile on the side of your, your home, but uh, bees like the pure gold sweat bee, the shiny green bee, its entire life cycle revolves around an old log. I found these bees nesting in an old log on the side of a road, uh, on the side of a, of a nature path. And um, without this log, they wouldn't have been able to nest. They don't nest in soil. They don't nest in stems. Logs are their preferred habitat. Um, and so if you live near a forested area, you're probably covered on there enough, being enough logs in the woods. Um, uh, and so you can plant things like asters and goldenrods to bring these shiny bees to your yard. Task number two is to do less. That's a great task. Just less is more. Clean up once a year, once the temperatures 
are 50 degrees. So that's May 1st. I don't recommend cleaning up before then as insects might not have woken up until the, the soil temps are, are warm. I encourage you to mow half as often. If you mow once a month, I encourage you to mow every other month. If you mow once a week, I encourage you to mow every other week. Not only can mowing less increase the number of like flowers in our lawns, but it, you know things like fireflies display on our lawns and mowing less can also create habitat for other insects we like. Look before you prune. So before you prune a woody shrub, look to see if it has a chrysalis or a pupa on it. It looks like a dry leaf. Doing this uh, acknowledges that our woody shrubs are habitat throughout the entire growing season. And you might want to consider that if you like butterflies in your garden in summer, what are they doing during the winter? They're on, they're on the stems. And then the last is, shh, don't disturb the bees while they're sleeping underground. So the more we till the soil, the more we disturb the nests of underground bees. Uh, another reason to not disturb the soil is that it brings weed seeds to the surface and it can create a real issue when uh, you're trying to, to garden. Um, there's a, a new fad called No Mo May, Low Mo Summer. You might hear about No Mo May in a, a couple of weeks. I encourage people to participate in No Mo May. Just you don't mow your lawn for the month of May. The idea is it helps uh, biodiversity. But just know this, that dandelions and clovers that come up in your yard are a nice snack, but they're not a complete meal compared to your pollinator garden. And so participate in No Mo May knowing that it's a half measure. It's a great complement to planting a garden. It's a great complement to reducing pesticide use, but it's not going to provide pollinators everything they need. Dandelions and clovers are exotic plants and they can provide some insects with food, but others simply would never go to those plants for, for pollen and nectar. And so I like to think of this as a really nice uh, sort of bonus or add-on action that we can all take um, to participating. If you have neighbor pushback to some of these ideas, I encourage you to consider cues to care. This is an idea coined by landscape uh, designer uh, and architect um, uh, Joan Nassauer in the 1990s, which basically says neighbors might be more um, uh, accepting of non-traditional aesthetics if there are signs that the landscape is cared for. Consider a stone border or a mowed edge or an edged border to your garden. Put a sign that says what you're doing and why and why it's important or why you care about it. Or include a sitting area to show that it's a garden that you want to spend time in rather than something that people might want to fear or harbor vermin. Can neighbor pushback, you might consider a mullet. Business in the front, neat mowed lawn in the front, party in the back. There can, you can have a big garden um, in the back that's more wild looking for, for pollinators or, or is maybe a little, less, uh, uh, a little less in tune with the conventional aesthetic of the neighborhood. I also encourage you to have a conversation. Talk to your neighbors about why you like doing this or why you think that these gardening for pollinators is important. The most important thing when you're having these conversations is to listen and acknowledge that not everybody comes to the conversation with the same values. Listen to hear, not to respond, and listen to hear what your neighbor thinks so that um, you can come to the conversation and leave um, and, and make it productive. Uh, this is something that I learned through doing a lot of outreach. It's really easy to get try to get people excited about bees. Bees are important because bees are important, but some people don't care about pollinators. Some people don't care about insects. We are scared of insects. And so how can you make sure that you come to the table uh, ready to, uh, to, to, to sort of actually have a, have a productive collaborative conversation? The third task is to mulch purposefully. Mulch is great because it helps get plants started, but it removes nesting opportunities for some insects. Right, insects like bees can't burrow through all this mulch that we ship in from all over the place. It's also just not a great environmental practice. Although mulch can be a nice cue to care, I encourage you to think about living mulch over processed mulch. And if you have to pick one over the other, definitely no landscaping fabric. Landscaping fabric not only spreads plastic parts throughout the environment, but it also really blocks the soil from, from nesting insects and, and nothing can get through. So absolutely no landscaping fabric for pollinators. Task four is to say no to mosquito gel. Eliminate pesticide use, actually all sides, you know, herbicide, insecticide, pesticide, fungicide, just el eliminate its use. You know, by definition, these pesticides are designed to kill insects. And by definition, a pollinator garden is designed to grow insects. And so those are, are, are add-ons. 
And then task five is to sort of um, let your garden um, speak for you. Um, experiment with what you uh, like doing, what works for your lifestyle. I encourage you to, to take your time with this, to know a plant. You got to grow a plant and it takes two to three years for some of these plants to get established. And so take your time and think about uh, how these plants are sort of settling into their new home. Think about, uh, and go out and watch who moves into your garden once you start planting different things. And at the very least, consider a trial area. Are you concerned about the lawn aesthetic or the, the leaving the leaves aesthetic? Well, consider leaving leaves over a portion of your bed or only one bed or only in the back as a way of sort of uh, thinking about these ideas a little differently. So my sample timeline uh, to, to illustrate is uh, in, May, in May 1, I clear away the leaves, I cut back the garden to eight inches, and then I place stems uh, in a pile. From May 1 to November 15th, I occasionally weed the garden, but mostly I'm just being astonished, taking way too many photos, looking for bees and stems and caterpillars on host plants, asking myself, is, is the garden working? On November 15th, I rake the layer leaves into a two-inch layer over the bed. I shake the seed heads, maybe into manila envelopes so I can start them inside, or I shake them over my garden. I cut the stems back for a neater appearance if I'd like. November 15th to May 1st, I rest, I dream big, I tell everyone about my garden. And, and that's a, a year in the life of the pollinator garden. It's really actually not a lot of work. And I think, as I said, less is more. And so thinking about that um, might be a motivator. Um, I have some examples to, to, to show you all, but I, I think I've, I've, I've definitely made my point and I'm, I'm definitely uh, uh, running out of time here. So I would like to just sort of um, skip to the end, uh, which, is, which is basically um, this. Let me see if I can to share this with you all. which is this. So one example I'd like to show you is, is, is my friend, Ben. Uh, ben was a, a field tech of mine uh, and he uh, just moved into a house in Medford and he was really interested in pr providing a garden on his balcony where he liked to play um, uh, the, the guitar. So he, his goals were to add greenery to the balcony and attract the bicolored striped sweat bee, Agapostum inverescens. Uh, and he developed these goals while he was at a nursery uh, uh, it, in one afternoon. He was like, I think I want to add uh, plants to my balcony. And so he went from an idea in the nursery to a garden in just a couple of hours. He picked up some cone flowers uh, at the nursery, picked up some, some Anna's hyssop at the nursery, and he planted the garden uh, on his balcony. And here's a photo he took playing the guitar that evening. Within the week, he attracted the bicolored striped swipe bee. And I know it's somewhat of uh, seem perhaps a cherry picked example, but I really wanna emphasize that it's quite this easy. That if you plant these plants for insects and you think intentionally about what you want to achieve, it works. Pollinator gardening is that simple and it can have incredible benefits. Now, mind you, Ben took these photographs like three years ago. He uh, still had them on his phone and he told me he loved looking at them. And he said, I moved out of my house recently. And I said, well, what happened to the plants? that you were growing. He said, I gave them to my mom. And I said, oh, does she like them? He's like, not only does she love them, but that single anise hyssop plant convinced her not to be scared of the digger wasps. It was the plant that he had grown for a bicolored striped sweat bee, carried down to Rhode Island and left on his mom's back patio that attracted the digger wasps and simply seeing big black wasps with blue wings be so gentle and not bother her at all, changed her entire perception about insects and motivated her to plant a garden. And so I think this is the power of pollinator gardening is that it can also inspire us to plant more gardens. When we see insects and we care about them, we're inspired to, to protect them and take measures uh, to, to, to change our actions to help them. And so let's recap the fundamentals. I'd like you to, to set a vision for what you'd like to accomplish, whether that's to, to plant a garden on your balcony or to attract a, a hummingbird or a butterfly. Then plant a wide diversity of native flowers and, and shrubs that delight both you and pollinators with the biology of those insects you're, you're seeking to attract in mind. Consider their life cycles when you're maintaining their, 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 um, your garden. Let nature do her thing and make a little bit of tidying if desired. You know, I think cues of care can go a long way towards changing people's perceptions, especially in the neighborhood. And then I can't stress enough to just go watch pollinators. And when you go and watch these pollinators, 
you find all sorts of reasons to grow goldenrod. You find reasons to grow goldenrod because monarchs are drinking from it and you love the way monarchs make you feel. You find reasons to grow wild bergamot because you love the big golden northern bumblebees and you know they're at risk. You find a reason to grow dogwoods because you're a bird watcher and you can't wait to see scarlet tanagers in your backyard. You find a reason to mow less because the little Andrina Dunning eye live in your backyard and they'll be out in just a couple of weeks. You find a reason to leave the leaves because cellophane bees perch on them and sun on them because they're warmer than the ground. You find a reason not to cut down stems because mason uh, wasps build little nests on the goldenrod stems out of, of mud that they gather and there's an egg and a baby wasp inside. You find a reason to take a flashlight out at night because there are bees sleeping in your garden that you planted for them and they're just too freaking adorable to pass up. And you find a reason to notice. I can't tell you how shocked I was that I saw this courtship dance of two little skipper butterflies, the male hopping behind the female in a little weedy patch. And if this wasn't a reason enough to, to garden, I, I hope I've convinced you that pollinators themselves uh, are deserving of, of our attention and our landscape stewardship. And that when we pollinate gardens for pollinators, that we can steward beautiful and sustainable landscapes, we can conserve biodiversity, and we can reconnect with nature uh, one garden at a time. Uh, thanks for your patience and your attention. Happy to take any questions you have. Um, and uh, have a good evening, all. Nick. Uh... Well, also, I'd love to see your pollinator garden. Please send me photos if you want. Send stories of your astonishment. I um, had a really hard time finding examples of gardens for this talk, and I would love uh, to know if you'd uh, want to share that with me. That would be wonderful. Oh, I think we have a lot of people that do have pollinator gardens. Nick, thank you from everyone. The chat is full of lots and lots of messages. Your enthusiasm just your passion for this topic, your knowledge for this topic. Um, you know, you've given us multiple ways we can begin or increase the biodiversity in our own gardens. Thank you so very much. This was just fascinating and uh, thank you. I would also just like to do a shout out to everyone. May 18th, the West Newberry Garden Club has a native plant sale. Um, lots of plants from Bagley Pond, um, which is a great place. So that's May 18th, beginning at 8.30. Um, but we do have a few questions. Um, the uh, Do you have a favorite goldenrod that will not spread too aggressively in the small garden? Um, I like um, uh, showy goldenrod, Solidago speciosa is a really nice one uh, for a sort of a sunnier area. Um, and then the sort of the, the blue stem goldenrod, the, the Sodeocesia is, is nice for shade. Nice. Yeah, avoid the Canadensis and Altissima, which are, are quite aggressive in the garden. Question about the specific name of the milkweed to attract butterflies. Um, so there's three uh, main kinds of milkweeds that are available uh, at nurseries. There's the um, there's the common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, or sy syriaca uh, which is the common milkweed. There's butterfly weed, which likes drier soils, and that's Asclepias tuberosa. And then there's the swamp or rose milkweed, Asclepias uh, incarnata, which favors medium to wet soils. Thank you. A question about your thoughts about co-mingling native plants with some non-native, non-invasive plants that provide pollen and nectar to generalists. Uh, I've read differing thoughts about it, but in a tight urban garden, oh, where'd it go? Anyway, um, she's read differing things about, but in a tight urban garden, she wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to think about the goals. And I think that co-mingling native plants and sort of non-invasive non-natives can be great, especially if you have particular relationships or memories tied up with those non-native plants. Like, I don't know, for me, uh, lavenders are, are just something that I think of a lot when I think of gardens and I think are a really nice example of a non-native that can nicely co-mingle with natives. Here's a good question. Define a native plant, please. Native to California and planted in New Hampshire. Uh, that would not, I would not consider that to be a native plant. I think you can think of native plants as um, 
So I, I broadly think of native to New England, um, those that sort of evolved alongside the, the, the forested landscapes of, of New England. Um, but of course, like uh, there there's plants that evolved in New England along the dunes that would not necessarily thrive in a forested landscape. And so think about sort of the the habitat you're in. You know, what's native to if you live on the 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 in the boreal forest, or you live in the deciduous forest, or you live in the highlands of the Berkshires versus the coastal plain of Cape Cod. Think about sort of what plants are native to um, the the eco region that you're in. Um, I think if you had to sort of put like a, a, a state cutoff, I would say probably don't go much farther, don't go really west of Pennsylvania, don't go much farther mm -hmm. south than Virginia for plants that are broadly um, native. Here's a good one. Um, is there a resource somewhere that details for Eastern native bees, how far they each, how far they travel from their nests? I see a lot of native bees on the roof deck and don't know how far they are traveling to get there. I'd love to find out. It's a really great question. It's something that I am curious about from a, a scientific or academic perspective. Um, yeah. In general, it varies. Uh, so we, we know that bee foraging distances, so how far they fly from their nest to flowers, varies based on body size. So small bees don't forage very far from the nest, um, one to 200 meters. Uh, larger bees um, forage, you know, about half a kilometer, so a qu quarter of a mile to a third of a mile. And then bigger bumblebees um, can go between half a mile and a mile. Um, I think this also sort of Studying insect movement is really hard. It's hard to track bees. They're fast and, and dark. Um, and I think over the next 10 years, uh, as technology gets better and smaller, I'd expect mm -hmm. for my answer to be a lot more refined. Um, something that I, I studied for my PhD was uh, I studied a, a blueberry bee, a specialist that, that visits blueberry flowers. And I found that it, it didn't forage more than 500 meters from the nest. So there were blue, blueberry abundantly. Sometimes it foraged 10 meters like literally just next door and other times it, it forged a bit farther, um, but it, it didn't go very far afield. Thank you. Thoughts on clovers, please. Red, crimson, and white. Are they good for um, bees? I think uh, clovers can provide um, good good food for, for bumblebees in the middle of the season. And many bumblebees like visiting clovers for, for nectar and pollen, but uh, I think they're, and, and I think they're nice, especially since you can grow clovers in places where, where other things might not be appropriate to grow. White clovers can be nice lawn substitute. And so adding in clovers into a lawn makes an otherwise ecologically sort of ecological desert for a bee have some food. I don't necessarily recommend planting them in the pollinator garden. I think clovers are really nice when used for a, a purpose, like on the edge of an agricultural field as, um, sort of a cover crop in your garden. Um, but yeah, I think I think there, there are better choices. And they're also better behaved choices for the garden. Um, My milkweed is destroyed by milkweed bugs every year. How can I control them without endangering the latter arriving monarchs? The later arriving monarchs. <laughs> So it's a good question. I, I don't know too much about who the, the natural predators are of, of milkweed, be, uh, milkweed beetles, uh, milkweed bugs. I, I, think, I think that's what you're talking about, uh, the milkweed, bu uh, the bugs, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, they form these sort of big colonies of orange and, and black insects. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I, um, I guess my recommendation would be if it's possible to sort of uh, in, increase the, the number of milkweed plants or increase the diversity of, of nectar plants. Like, yeah, I imagine that there are some predators, might, there might be a wasp that that parasitizes them or or birds that, that eat them. But I uh, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. I would, I just would if, from using pesticides. Yeah. I would just say don't. Yeah. don't oh, no, no. Yeah. Can you keep leaves in the garden and then apply compost over it? I'm sorry, what was the uh, the question? It's can you keep leaves in your garden and then apply compost over it? Hmm. Hmm. Why it's a good question. Um, I um, 
Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, I guess it depends on what, what the aim is. I think if the idea is for the leaves to sort of enrich the health of the soil, then the leaves would start to break down. That should be fine. I, I would not want to put the compost on before May 1st. It would smother the insects in the leaves. The leaves are very nice and aerated, and that's sort of what the insects like. Um, but I guess I would also recommend maybe just raking the leaves off and putting the compost on directly on the soil um, rather than burying the leaves, I think. Question is uh, for buckwheat as a late season forage for bees. Buckwheat. You know, I, I see buckwheat. I see buckwheat uh, definitely as a cover crop. I think if, uh, especially like a, if it's a farm field or agricultural system, then I, I, I'll i say you know, clovers and, and buckwheats, really nice cover crops to provide food and otherwise landscape where there probably isn't a lot. Um, I've, I've really seen a lot of, of honeybees and, and common bumblebees on buckwheat. I haven't seen a lot of too many other insects. Um, so I don't necessarily know if it, it's the, the, the best forage for for maximizing poll pollinator diversity, but again, I guess it's, it guess depends on your goal. And if if the goal is, it, what, I'm not sure the landscape you're you're growing in, um, but yeah. for, if it's a garden, I think goldenrods and asters are definitely the the top choice for late season forage. Um, I think in sort of a more agricultural setting, I think buckwheat or clovers could be, could be really nice to sort of fill that gap when you you don't want them to persist the following year as an annual. I mean, just one more question. Um, I have dozens of milkweed plants, but not many monarch butterflies. What else can I do to encourage them? Plant different varieties? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's, um, you know, monarchs, it's, there's, there's, they roam around the landscape, right? So I, I would, first, I wouldn't feel bad if monarchs haven't found your, your garden. The, the second thing is they might have found your garden. But egg mortality and larval mortality, very high in monarchs. A monarch might lay upwards of 500 eggs in her life, and just one or two makes it to adulthood. And so it's very possible. It takes five seconds for a monarch to find a flower, curl her abdomen underneath, and lay an egg. And it takes five seconds for a paper wasp to come in and snag that egg or snag that larva. And so I guess my first reaction is I'm not sure. I, I would... I would I wonder whether monarchs have found your garden. Um, I think the second thing I wonder is it definitely plant more milkweed could be great. And then the other thing is I would encourage planting nectar plants for the adults. So in summer, things like uh, Liatris, Blazing Star, is a great nectar plant for monarchs. And also planting to help monarchs out during their fall, bound, fall migration south to Mexico, planting goldenrods and asters can be really important help along the way. Uh, and helping that part of the life cycle. Great. Nick, thank you so much again. This has been a fabulous evening to spend with you. So many, many thanks um, and lots of thanks from everyone that's been on this uh, webinar. We will be sending out um, the link to the recording. Uh, Nick has allowed us to once again um, record it, which is hugely helpful. So. Many, many thanks and good luck everyone with your gardens and thank you for attending tonight. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, Nick.